really happy to welcome to the Cine City 2008 Festival podcast Robert Cannon and Karina McFarlane. Welcome to Cine City. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you guys, your film Three Miles North of Malcolm is playing on Sunday the 30th at half six. Um, I suppose I should dive straight in by saying, um, very rudely, you're not going to be here, but you've got a very good excuse for that. We do indeed. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I should just say that, you know, we were really looking forward to being here because Brighton's, I've always thought of Brighton as my hometown. You went I to went university, to uni here. here, I love Lindy. Brighton. <laughs> um, this is the first showing of our theatrical cut. We were really looking forward to it and, you know, as often happens in life, you kind of wait around for ages for something good to happen. We've been making this film for a very long time and... Uh, the suddenly we heard the great news that we've been nominated uh, for Best Documentary at the British Film Awards. The British, British Independent Film Awards, and so basically two buses came at once at the same time uh, on Sunday, and so we of course have to be present. That's okay, we won't hold that against you. We've got you in spirit and in voice, so that's, that's okay. That's it. <laughs> so, you. you know, you're starting off with the obvious question, you know, your film Three Miles North of Moncombe. What's the film about? Okay, so the film essentially is a quirky, offbeat adventure <laughs> set in uh, the Swedish forest. It, it's a documentary, it, it's real. We, we filmed uh, an actual happening. Once a year, this uh, place in Sweden, this commune, invite a thousand people to essentially open up to themselves, to each other, and uh, we follow a group who meet there and are placed in a sharing group at random and uh, one of them very comically is an Aussie backpacker Uh, he's a rugby coach and he uh, he was just backpacking around Europe as our our uh, friends the Aussies do and uh, he thought he was going to a music festival in Sweden with a load of blonde babes and instead what he found was um, (laughs) essentially a very quirky uh, spot with uh, people taking uh, shamanic rituals and naked sweat lodges rather seriously and so uh, it, it's a comedy it's a comedy of um, of errors in some ways and of of spiritual awakening of friendships that's basically what it's about two weeks they go through two weeks of this mm-hmm. so yeah you mentioned there about nick and nick is you know even though this is a very you know it's an ensemble piece because of the group nick is the the main focus you know i would say and again maybe it's being an outsider from the commune nick's the person that i identify with um and that i'm kind of rooting for is not the right word but the, you, know, the way you don't want to fall you don't want him to fall in with the cult kind of thing and so you know but Nick you know you kind of found him quite fortuitously didn't you because you only had what something like four hours when you first got there to sign up with a group that's exactly right we always knew that uh, um, one of the sort of key subjects characters that we had to find was someone who was uh, very new to the experience new to the place um, was a kind of fish out of water character and, and we also knew that if they were kind of somewhat cynical or, or reluctant it, it would be much more interesting and that there would be some some humour in that situation so we were kind of looking for those sort of characteristics and someone but obviously uh, Nick kind of gave us um, you know even more than we could possibly have have planned for I mean he, he was just perfect he well he's an of, Aussie isn't he he's, he turned <laughs> up and you know I think the great thing about Australians is um, they're very blunt. They're very cynical. They're witty. They're, they're cynical, and you know, as you see, Nick is kind of very uh, anti, uh, anti in, a in a way. You know, everything that's going on. However, they have this very sportsman-like kind of sense of, well, I'll give it a go anyway. And obviously, that's perfect for the film. We needed someone who was going to push themselves to do things that they were reluctant to do and they were critical of. And uh, that kind of worked dramatically and comically. You know, had Nick been British, he may have said oh my god these these are a bunch of weirdos I'm not going to join in I don't want to look like a fool Nick on the other hand when these guys are weirdos I'll give it a go Mm -hmm. you know and that that ethos that that spirit fundamentally actually was the bridge between him as a human being and the ethos of the place which is about giving things a go letting your guard down and trying so actually the difference between Nick as a human being at his core and the people there isn't so different I guess and it took a lot of 
odd events and, and, and shamanic rituals for them to kind of work that out, I guess. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I think Australians are, in a sense, more spiritual than you know, they might even realise. And that, I think that's encapsulated by the, the phrase, no worries, mate. I mean, you know, they have this idea that that's a very spiritual phrase if you really kind of analyse it and you want to get deep about it. Mm-hmm. The ethos of the festival is what allowed the film to happen because people are being very well sorry i'm saying very extremely <laughs> open and you know you know, with themselves their, their lives their feelings to you guys on camera and it kind of feels that you couldn't have made this documentary anywhere else or at least anywhere else that didn't have those kind of beliefs as well at its heart yeah certainly openness is the key and you know it, it took us a while to initially build the trust of the kind of organizers of the commune of the festival and once we had really built their trust and they kind of felt that they understood us and they knew us and they kind of felt that it was important for them for the film to be made too as soon as they were on side they really helped us to convey to all of the people coming that opening up for the film was kind of another extension of one of the many experiences that were sort of available to people at the festival the idea was that people would dive into all kinds of things in a sort of attempt to open up and in a way that being filmed was just an extension of that. And I think also taking your point that the way the film is made is specific to the context. I think to some extent it's our debut as directors and of course that is quite significant, the amount of passion that we've had bottled up for years um, and all of our ambitions and creative visions and, and sort of desires to make moving images I guess um, were really fueled by everyone else's freedom I mean when you've got people running around naked all around you sort of going you know okay look I don't give a toss what are you scared of you know we as directors we were inspired to some extent to go you know what there's a scene Rob and I had talked about how we thought it might work but of course it's a documentary so you can't plan it in, in its entirety you can hope and then we go, you know what, let's go really for what we want to go for. Let's, let's put that camera right in the action. Let's move with the people. Let's roll with the bodies. And that's something mm. that I guess they, it gave us, the place gave us that extra edge. Yeah, I think um, because really the essence of the philosophy of the place is freedom in a sense, kind of freedom to express yourself and be who you are, whoever you are. They're very open, they're very eclectic, you know, in terms of welcoming any kind of spiritual or psychological or esoteric uh, philosophy and, and in that sense you know that enabled us to be completely free in, in how we approach the film it enabled us to be very spontaneous and you know, enabled, enabled us to react to situations and you know for our first uh, film as directors that meant we could be very free and also in terms of like the trust we gained everyone always says how did you get access you know how did you get those particular individuals to let you film them in such intimate settings And I think, you know, aside from the fact that Rob and I are very good, nice people and we told them we were going to never take advantage of them or we weren't out for any kind of ridiculing and we were just really genuinely wanting to make our first film and if they ever felt uncomfortable to tell us. But I think, you know, we were able to be more of ourselves in a way. We'd worked in low budget and medium budget films in the UK where there's perhaps more formality. I mean, again, it was drama, but... I guess we were able to be ourselves more and just to be really upfront with these people and ultimately things that are genuine show I think I think you can see when you watch the film what people are responding to the audiences why they come away feeling warm and happy and like it was worth going to see the film is because of some of that chemistry that came about from our our, us being so open with these people and them in turn giving us back their truths I guess which is great cinema and great documentary. Mm -hmm. This being your debut feature I know that both of you have you know been in the film world for quite some time but Karina it was you who found this story and kind of brought it to Rob wasn't it and so kind of what was it about this you know did you have other plans you said you know you mentioned their drama were you thinking about going down the drama route for that initial feature? Well you've hit the nail on the head I mean that's a good question (laughs) I think Rob and I feel that quite strongly because essentially both of 